ought to tell you that I dreamed of killing all the people I ever lived with, including the policemen in Cal, several times, each one of them. So sooner or later, I was bound to do it at least once, someday. To his knowledge, she did her job well, and there was never any quarrel between the two of you in 21 years. She was a deaf mute. No one could have quarreled with her. <laughs> she was very fat. And she slept every night like a log. And she ate a lot. Because when she ate like that and she walked about, I could not bear it. What I have just told you has something to do with my character. All I'm saying is that I'm the kind of person who cannot stand people stuffing themselves and sleeping well. It would have been just anybody who slept and ate like that, it would have been the same. So it was not because it was her that I could not stand it, it's because I can't stand it in anyone. And sometimes I had to leave the table. Have I told you how much I love the garden? You see, there, I was peaceful in the house. I could never be sure that she would not come up to me and kiss me. I did not like her kissing me. She was very fat, and the rooms are very small. I felt she was too fat for the house. Did you tell her? No. Why? Because it was only for me who saw that she was too fat for the house. And it was not only her. My husband used to be as thin as a beanpole, and I thought, he's too tall for the house. And sometimes I had to go out in the garden not to see his head bouncing off the ceiling. So you see, monsieur, that things were already a bit off in that house. Once, I was 25, and I was loved by this magnificent man. And I used to believe in God then. And I would go to Mass every day. And he was living with another woman, so because of that, I would not have anything to do with him. And we were madly in love with each other for two years. Madly. It was he who separated me from God. After God, I saw everything only through him. He was the only one I listened to. And he was everything to me. And then one day, God was not there anymore. Only him. Only him. And one day, he lied. What would you say if I told you that they're going to put me in a mental hospital in Versailles? I'd say you're right. Well, I've answered you. So I am mad? What would you say if I ask you if I am mad? I'd say yes again. So you're talking to a mad woman? Yes. Well, why ask me where I put the head? Maybe I don't remember where I put it. I've forgotten the exact spot. Just a vague indication of a word. Forest. Bank. Why? To say it. To you. 
Yes. As a souvenir? Yes. No. You hear? But there are lots of things that I haven't told you. Would you like to know what they are? No. Well, that's too bad. If I had been able to tell you where the head is, would you go on talking to me? No. You've given up. That's it? Yes. If I had managed to tell you why I killed this big fat deaf woman, would you go on talking to me? No, I don't think so. She asks, what do you want? And you say, you want to try. Try it. Try to know, to get used to that body, those breasts, that scent, to beauty to the risk of having children implicit in that body, that smooth body, that face, that naked skin, and the human being between the skin and the life it contains. You say you want to try for several days, perhaps, perhaps for several weeks, perhaps even for your whole life. Try what? She asks. To love, you answer. Young. She would be young. And in her clothes and hair, there'll be a clinging smell. And you try to identify it. And in the end, with your experience, you would be able to. And you'd say, a smell of cedar and heliotrope. And another evening, accidentally, you give her pleasure. And she cries out. You tell her not to. She stops. She says she won't anymore. Perhaps you get a pleasure from her you've never known before. I don't know. Nor do I know if you hear the muted roar of her pleasure in her breathing, in that soft vibrations going back and forth between her mouth and the outside air. I don't think so. She opens her eyes and says, what bliss. And you put your hand over her mouth to silence her. You tell her, one does not say such things. She shuts her eyes and says, she won't do it again. She asks if they talk about it. You say no. She asks, what do they talk about? You say, they talk about everything else. Everything except that. What about looking? Haven't you ever looked at a woman? You say no. Never. So what does she ask? What do you look at? You say everything else. She stretches. Is silent. She's 
smiles. She goes back to sleep. You look at her. Then you give up. You stop looking at anything. You shut your eyes so as to get back into your difference, your death. When you open your eyes again, she's still there. Still there. You look at all the places on the body, the face, the breasts, the mingled sight of her sex. You look at where the heart is. The beat seems different, more distant. The word occurs to you more alien. The beat is regular. It seems it could never stop. And you bring your body close to her body. And it's warm, moist. She's still alive. And while she lives, she invites murder. You wonder how to kill her. And who will kill her? I hope I'll never know anything, anything in the world the way you do. I don't want to know anything the way you do. With that death derived certainty, that hopeless monotony, the same every day of your life, every night, and that deadly routine of lovelessness. <laughs>